right, all right. Welcome to High on Hope, everybody. How are we doing tonight? How are we doing? Let out a show. Who's happy to be free tonight? Who's happy to? That's right. Well, we got this area up here you could come worship in if you wanted to. We'd, we'd appreciate it if you want. But uh, Go ahead and sing along and worship with us song tonight.
treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and you put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again.
voices. Lord, there's nothing. Sarah is speaking tonight, and she's about to sing this song, and she is a beautiful singer, and she's beautiful on the inside and out. She has a year sober as of yesterday. One year sober right here. She's about to sing her prophesy. <laughs> I was going to save this for the introduction, but uh, I, how long ago was it now that I met Sarah? This true story about God's miracles and how you never know what God's going to do in your life. Uh, almost two years ago, the first time I met Sarah, I was working at Peer Solutions, and her mom brought her to Peer Solutions, and she, was, she wasn't in very good shape when I first met her, to say the least. And uh, man, I'll never forget, uh, I prayed, prayed for her in her car with her mom, and she went off to rehab. And then when she came back from rehab, she was completely transformed into this beautiful woman you see in front of us today. And I had no idea, I had no idea, you know, when I was praying over her that it would lead us to where we are today. And not only has Sarah seen breakthrough and got her life back together and God has restored her completely, besides being, you know, I got a really amazing one of my best friends, uh, one of my worship team people, I mean, just amazing church family, but also her family has has come back to church all because of this, because of Sarah's sobriety. I feel like that, I mean, you don't under, you don't have, you don't never know what getting sober is going to do for your entire family. Like when you get sober, you send these ripples out into the universe and you never know what God has in store for you. So what I, what I guess I want to say is don't ever give up and just keep going forward. And don't ever lose faith in God because I promise if you're here tonight, he has a plan for your life. And the miracles are going to keep coming and coming and coming. And Sarah's story and testimony tonight is so beautiful. So we love you, Sarah.
process is so long that you start getting weary about, you know, just not being able to make it or not having faith or whatever. You feel like you can't hear God talking to you. It gets, you get in that dark place and then you let the devil come in and talk bad words to you and speak lies to you. And then when you start to believe him, that's when he gets you. piggyback on that because as I looked out in the room when she started singing that man you're singing that like you've never sang it before and the part when we talk about fear can go to hell and shame can go there too man I felt the shame part so strong I feel like the Holy Spirit's just trying to do something today um shame and fear can be one of those things that the enemy can like seep in whether that's fear of you getting custody of your kids back or fear of um moving away from somewhere you're familiar or moving into a group of like, or a place that you're unfamiliar with where you know nobody. Um, any of those things are, the devil does look for seats to crack into and I don't like to give the God any, or give the devil any like glorification. I'm just saying he is like looking for that crack to seep in. So don't let him. And God doesn't want you to live in that shame. Like it literally can go to hell and stay there just like we're singing in this song. Like that's where it belongs. That's where it needs to stay there because that's not what God sees in you. Like you're a daughter, you're a son of God. You don't have to stay in that shame. It doesn't matter what you did. He's not worried about that. He's not worried about that. He literally casts your sins out into the sea of forgetfulness. People on earth may not be able to do that and they hold grudges and they may hold that against you, but God is not like that. So. If religion has pounded that in your head, it's wrong. That's religion, that's tradition. God's not like that. And when you get a God of your own understanding, man, the God who I serve, the God who I found is not like that. It's not religious, it's not traditional. Like he's a God of grace and mercy and Man, he is using the most unlikely people right now to be raised up to change so much of this earth. Like we're the army God's rising up. Every single person in this room, like the most unlikely, like unlikely people in the world, he's pulling together. And if you don't feel that when I say that, cause I swear it's like the Holy Spirit is so strong in this place. All these new faces and all these people, like I feel such a strong, heavy, like, Man, it's so good. Like, he's gonna use us. Like, is that not exciting? Like, we're, that's his purpose for us. Like, people may not see that, and some of these churches and religious people may not see that, but like, we are mighty. Like, we have like a full blown Jesus living inside of us. And when you grasp that, you, nobody can stop you. All the naysayers, you're, the devil can't stop you. So, we're gonna go back into that. And man, prophesy that because fear and shame that's where it needs to go so if you're letting that those two things hold you back today I just pray right now all over this place God that you just release that from them Lord because they are children of the God Almighty and they are worthy and that that shame and that fear just deserves to stay in hell so sing it Sarah Make it break off. When you worship, that's what it does. It breaks things off of you. So scream it. Scream it. I know who say you. God, I belong to you. And fear can go to hell. Shame can go there too. I know who say you.
Man, how we doing, y'all? How's everybody doing? That was awesome, wasn't it? Was that good or what? Come on. Come on. That was amazing. Man, it's just a blessing to be up here. It's just such a, uh, it's amazing what is going on here at the Reach United here at High on Hope. Um, man, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Um, I wanted to, uh, I want to bring my friend Ryan up here. Ryan, come up here for a second, man. So last year, uh, Ryan was serving relentlessly for the Reach United at our church, and he was a big part of our ministry and helping it grow and spreading the word. And then some some bad things happened, and we had to let him go for a little bit, and Today he came back to church, and man, it was the best thing I've seen in a long time, man. And I just want to honor Ryan, and uh, welcome home, man. We love you. We're so glad you're back. Look look at that smile, y'all. I mean, that's Jesus right there. We love him so much, and uh, so... Where were you, Ryan? Tell us where you were. But tell, I want you, what I want you to do is tell everybody what you told me out there, what you did every, every made sure you did every week when you were there. Tell them where you were and what you did. Um, November 17th, last year, um, I was facing charges. Uh, I went to prison. Um, I made sure that while I was in jail, um, I was nervous before going in. Um... The pod that God decided to put me in, and everything had a had a pastor in it, which that was that was a God shot. Um, every Wednesday he would have Bible study at two o'clock. Um, he still writes me. I just got a letter from him uh, Sunday. I just got out on Friday. Uh, in. Um, <laughs> Uh, coming from this and then going to that setting, it was probably one of one of the hardest things I've done. Um, in March, I got sent to prison uh, in St. Mary's. Um, I made sure that every every night while I was locked up, I would read my Bible. I had a Bible study guide that my grandma bought me. Everything they allowed it to be sent in to me. Um, while I was at, in prison, I made sure that every Sunday I went to church. I talked to the pastor there. He's actually he's actually from Parkersburg. His name's uh, Brent Radiball. Um, I struggled. I struggled, but I kept my faith. I didn't lose my faith. Um, I made sure that I prayed. Uh, I tried to keep in contact with this place as much as possible by calling Tim and asking how everything was going. I was so excited to come here. I was so excited to come here. Like, I was in the old building whenever I left, and this building, this building's amazing. So, but, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be back. Yeah. 
We love you, man. Thank you so much. We can't wait to see what the future holds for all of us. Just let's pray over Ryan right now. God, I just want to continue to pray over Ryan and just keep him, keep him seeking you, God, and just keep him safe and protected, God. Keep him on the path of recovery, God. Just continue to just bless him and, and just bless him for all of his uh, obedience and, and just continue to just fill his life with blessings and miracles, God. And just thank you for bringing us, Ryan, back safely. And I just ask you to continue to bless our family here at the Reach. Keep us growing. Keep us loving. And keep bringing us the lost and the broken, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a good day, man. I love that dude so much. We are, uh, we are so blessed, man, um, here at the Reach United. I was going to teach a little bit. Uh, and I will, I will. I, it's, it's really simple, too, what I wanted to get out, get out here. Who was at church Sunday? Yes. Who's coming to church this Sunday? Come on. Yes. Remind everybody, sign up for transportation. Oh, I'm going to do announcements. Oh, I got to do announcements. I don't normally do announcements. Usually Mike is here and he does them. He's not here. He's taking one of our... Guys, the Emmaus Walk, so keep those guys in your prayers doing it during the Emmaus Walk. Announcements, I'll get to it, yeah. All right. Um, so weekly events, we have Passion Tribe, ages 18 to 26, led by Austin Cambam every other Monday at 7.30 here in this building, uh, starting October 3rd. True Disciple Class, book 2 and 3 at 6 p.m., book 1 at 7 p.m., and that's at Wednesday, on Wednesday nights. And that is hosted by uh, Dennis and uh, Natasha and the dynamic duo of uh, Brian and Charity Wise. So come do that. It's an amazing time. It'll get you to teach you a lot about the Bible and what we do here. And we, we do encourage everybody, if you do want to serve in our ministry, that you would complete the true discipleship class, including worship team and stuff like that. So uh, do that. High on Hope, it's Thursday nights. We are going to be moving times back to 630 after the Halloween party, the Halloween party is on October 27th at 7 p.m. We also have a Cedar Trip Point, uh, Cedar Point trip coming up October 15th. And if you would like to uh, bless any of the children that are going to that with some, uh, maybe sponsor one of them so they can go, uh, any money would go to that. That would be awesome. Um, it would be so good. Um, what's that? October 15th. Um, we're also having our co uh, costume party October 27th, right here, 7 p.m., Food, Worship, and the Word. Fall Festival, October 29th. We're going to have hay rides, 12 to 3. It's going to be all over this place out here. So spread the word. Serve night is this Friday, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Anybody who serves is required to be here. Try to be here. It's very important that you're here. We're going to be talking about a lot of stuff. Uh, we're going to be, uh, it's just an amazing time to fellowship, and if you do want to serve, please show up. We have all kinds of uh, jobs that need done around here. We need help with security and uh, uh, the kids' ministry, and, and just, I know Tiffany needs help with the uh, with all the media stuff, and I know our worship team would love to have some more people, so if you're interested in that, please uh, come to serve night tomorrow night. And then theme night is October 2nd, which is Sunday. And it's going to be a wear your favorite team jersey night, preferably Steelers. No, no cow, no, no, no Cowboys fans are allowed. Or Bengals or Browns fans. So, <laughs> and especially if you like the New England Patriots, don't come to church. I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. <laughs> and don't forget this Saturday, Alex Victory's new single drops. It'll be a dollar on uh, iTunes. Give it up for Alex, man. His music is amazing. Man, playing music with Alex over the last few years has been one of the, the bright spots of my life. It's just an amazing experience getting to play with somebody so talented and just so, so obedient and disciplined and just, he's amazing. So give it up for Alex Victory and... <clears throat> So that, that, that's about it. Okay. We got a lot going on in case you guys didn't notice. So, 
So uh, I just encourage you to come and get involved. Um, man, the, the best way to get closer to God and get closer to a church family is to serve. Like, it will change your life. And a lot of people, especially uh, in early sobriety, they, are, they don't know what to do with all the free time they have. And free time can be very hazardous to your sobriety. So come serve at church, man. Get around some positive people. Get around some people that are going to help you and support you and pray with you and push you and, and be there for you and be a positive influence in your life. And that's kind of going to segue into my little message here about what Tim preached about on Sunday. I had Tim send me the notes, and I got reading. It was like the first paragraph. I told him I could speak for an hour on just the first couple paragraphs. But it says... Uh, the inner wind, the circle. Real friends make us better. Real friends make us better. Real friends make us better. As iron sharpens iron, so man sharpens the, the countenance of his friend. Proverbs 27, 17. Your friends matter, so stop fooling yourselves. Evil companions will corrupt good morals and character. 1 Corinthians 15:33. There are good people that will point out your blind spot, and there's people who will allow you to stay blind. Make sure you know who your true friends are. There are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 18, 24, NLT. That is just the most important, the, the most important thing I ever learned in recovery. The most important thing. My first sponsor said, you know, used to say, show me your friends, and I'll show you your recovery. You know, show, show me your friends, and I'll show you my recovery. You know, so, you know, this is why it's so important to surround yourself with, with people that are going towards God, man. Going, people that will call you out when you're messing up, when you're thinking the wrong thing, or when you're doing the wrong thing, or when you're, when you're going towards the wrong thing. It's nice to have people that'll say, you need to not do that, you know. You have to have an open mind when you're talking to these people, and you got to be honest with these people, and you got to be, you know, they tell you, they say, how am I going to get sober? How do I get sober? How do I get sober? How do I do this thing? H-O-W, honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. How? Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. You got to be honest with the people around you. That way you're not holding anything back because if you're not telling the truth, we don't know we don't know what's going on with you. We can't help you. If you come and tell us, if you come and you're honest with us, you're going to save us a whole lot of time. We're going to be able to get to the solution and we're not going to be living in the problem for as long. You know, so that's why being honest is so important. Open-mindedness. You got to be open-minded. You got to realize that that your way isn't going to work anymore and that you're probably going to need some direction and uh, you're going to need some help, and you're going to have to be willing to listen to these people and be corrected by these people, you know, and do what they tell you to do. You know, if they're, if they, you, you got to be able to take correction from your peers. Because if not, you're going to keep doing the same thing. You're going to keep living in the same cycles like Tim talks about all the time. And what's going to happen is you're either going to get hurt or worse or you're going to waste a whole lot of time and then end up in the same place that you started from when all you really had to do was take some direction and take and, and listen to the people that were trying to help you. You know, I've seen it happen over and over again, over and over and over again in, in recovery all the time. You know, we, we tell people, don't get in relationships early. Don't do these things. Don't do that thing. And what do they do? They go get in a relationship. And then and then next thing you know, I'm like, well, uh, I'll see you when you get out of detox, because, you know, and it happens all the time. <laughs> You know, that's, it's not really funny. <laughs> I'm not laughing. But I see it happen all the time. All the time. There's a reason we do this thing, man. Because you've got to give yourself time to find out who God really, what God really has for you. You know, you start worshiping another person, guess what? You're not going to be worshiping God. You know, the book tells us, the book, the big book talks about how we worship other things. We'll worship social media. We'll worship our jobs. We'll worship another person. And what happens is that lets us down and it doesn't get us anywhere but hurt or worse. And then when we finally figure it out, we've wasted a whole lot of time and we got to start from the beginning. You know? 
get a sponsor, get some people that are going to pour into you and help you and be willing to change. They care about you. Pastor Tim loves people. He has poured into me more than any pastor has in my entire life. My sponsor, Pastor Corey Chambers. Notice I'm saying pastor in front of these people. I mean, this is like these are the people that I look up to and the people that I, that I strive to be like are my pastors. You know, but you got to get one that's, that's going to grade your paper and give you the right grade. Because if, if you don't have a sponsor, if you don't have people pouring into your life, what's going to happen is you're going to grade your own paper and you're going to give yourself a, a, you know, a grade you don't deserve. You're going to give yourself the wrong grade. You're going you're gonna to keep doing things the wrong way, right? And we got to be willing to grow. we got to be willing to take direction. And we got to be willing to... It's like a daycare in here tonight, man. <laughs> Give that baby some milk. <laughs> but you got to be willing, man, to listen to the people, man. I'm telling you, you got to do things different. Because if you do things the same way you've always done, you're going to get what you've always got. And in life, you got to do things you've never done if you want things you've never had. So, back to my... The beginning of my teaching here, I said the most important thing I've learned was surround yourself with the winners. Find the winners. Find the people that are chasing relentlessly after God. And God's favor will pour on you from them. If you surround yourself, with, you're going to get some favor. You're going to get some places. You're going to get some good places if you surround yourself with the right people. But if you surround yourself with the wrong people, man, it's going to be bad. It can be really bad. You know, and I just hope and pray that everybody here, you know, chooses, to, chooses the right people to surround themselves with. We would love to have you here at High on Hope. We'd love to have you at the Reach. Love to have you at the meetings. Man, I'm always here for you guys. If you guys need anything, please come share with us. Come talk to Tim. Talk to Dave, you know. Talk to Nico and Logan and Sarah, man. We, we will, we're here for you, man. You know, so that's what I got. Amen. Okay, okay. So. That brings us to the te- that brings us to the testimony tonight. I already talked about her a little bit, man, but I just uh So proud of her and we have an amazing uh, friendship, man. We, we, t- we talk a lot, and uh, it's just been an amazing blessing in my life uh, that I never saw coming. And that's how God works, is you don't see God coming a lot of the times. And like I said, it's just amazing what God has done in her life and just blessed her with, I mean, you, I would have never said, oh, yeah, she's going to be, she's going to get sober, stay sober, be on my worship team, and her whole family's going to start. I just, it, it's crazy, man. Come on. How good is that? With that, I'll give you Sarah File. Thank you. Okay, so I like what it all ties into. Um, like what he was saying with finding your friends. And it's the craziest thing. I'm going to start with just this. Um, so in 2016, I met Nico um, and whenever I was drinking really heavily. I haven't drank in almost six years. So, but little did I know that whenever I met her, that I would be up here getting to worship beside her. Um, And she signed, she gave me a Bible. It was my very first Bible, and I kept it through my entire addiction. It's crazy. She said, you are a beautiful daughter of an almighty God. And the almighty God thing is absolutely true. Um, I can say for sure that I would not be where I am right now if it wasn't for the reach. And I also like that we're doing the, um, well, the serve night tomorrow. Because whenever I came here um, down on Latrobe Street, I just thought I was going to do meetings and 
you know, work my steps, and that was it. Um, and it started at High on Hope, and then I started coming to church in the evening. Um, and then I s- recognized Austin, and I'm telling you, when I met him two years ago, <laughs> I was like, get this guy out of the back seat. Um, why are we praying right now? Like, it was a mess. Um, I'm so thankful for that. And I feel like I have so much I wanted to say, but I just, I believe that the unity and having people to surround you and pour into you constantly. I don't know how many times that I would message Logan and be like, I'm breaking down. I need, you know, I'm just being attacked by everything. And it wasn't that I wanted to go and use. It's just all the things that happen to you whenever you get sober and trying to deal with them, not getting high. Um, it's a whole other ball game. You feel it all. Um, but being a part of this church is just, uh, it's truly family here. Um, I never thought I'd have as close friends. I never, ever had closest friends like I do now. Um, And I get to go to places like Beckley to help get them started in their high on hope. You know, so it's spreading. And I just, the people here are so, they just pour into you and they love you genuinely. Um, I didn't really want to talk a lot about my past. Um being an addiction uh, because we all know what that's like Um, but keeping my faith and slowly I get to see my family come to church I've never loved harder I think it's just because um, I didn't want to cry um I'm just the gratefulness that you feel when you really know God and whenever you really talk to him and the things that he's done in my life and being sober for a year. I got my license today. And that was a long time coming. I haven't had my license in almost over six years also. Um, so that's good. But it's just all these all these little things that are happening and the friendships and I get to pour into people also and to see where I'm at now today. If I wish I would have brought a picture of what I looked like when Austin met me the first time, it, you wouldn't recognize me. Um, there's so much I wanted to say. I'm not good at this part. There goes Mel chiming in. (laughs) She's the biggest supporter of everybody here, too. She's our cheerleader. And the relationship that me and my mom have now is, it's rocky um, because I've put her through so much. But she has been through all the bad, and now she gets to go through all the good with me. And just like my brother coming, and now his kids come. I didn't even know they believed in God or (laughs) any of that. Um, And I was a total mess. They, my whole family, wrote me off. Um, I lived in the same house with my dad, and he he would get up and leave the room um, if I was in it. And he wouldn't talk to me for months at a time. Um, Now he took me to get my driving test today. So. Um, it's just all these little things, I think. Um, and, like, I listen to my Bible. on. It might be on my phone because I feel like I understand it better, but I get, that's, like, something I love to do. I love to hear it in the morning. I love to listen to it before I go to bed. Um, and being able to worship, I've, oh, man, there's something that happens to you whenever you fully give in to. I mean, when you completely surrender When, if you've ever felt it, that you know what I'm talking about. The goosebumps, the all of it. Um, it's absolutely amazing. But I just, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now 
and not just clean and sober. I've, I'm actually free. I'm happy. Um, and this is just the absolute beginning. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like five years from now. Um, I've came a long, long way. Um, and I started out in Charleston. That was scary. Um, <laughs> then I moved to Lynn Street. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> but it led me to the reach. And sometimes you do have to go through the bad and the ugly. And if you push through it and you keep your faith in it, I mean, you're look, you stand, you know, you see me standing up here now. Where, where am I? It's, there's nothing like it. And I've got to meet all of the angels. Like, I was there when they first started, and it's... Um, these girls are amazing also, and you guys mean so much to me. Um, I look forward every Thursday and Sunday getting to see you guys. Um, I can't wait to see what all happens in your guys' life, too. Man, it's, God's been so good to me, um, and I just want you guys all to feel that. There is nothing better than the love of God, I tell you. Uh, so I'm not going to talk too much. I'm going to let Dave come up here and do his thing. But I just, I'm so grateful. I'm just absolutely grateful. <laughs> Are you bringing up here? <laughs> You're good. Um, Alex is amazing. I'm so happy and proud of him. He's doing such good things. I'm, that's, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, I can't wait to see what all's coming in the future. I'm so proud of this entire team, the church. I love everybody in it. <laughs> I have so much love to spill out. I just feel like it's not all coming out the way I wanted it to. Um, but thank you. So I just want to speak a minute on... Um, just planting a seed. So six and a half years ago, I, I, you know, met this girl at a church that was drunk. She said she wasn't drunk, but she was drunk. <laughs> and um, I don't, I, you know, I just, I just heard something inside me telling me that to give her. I had this brand new Bible. I, I only had it a day. I didn't even write my name in it. But um, just saying, like, I needed to give it to her. And I never saw her again until about a year ago, and, um, you know, at the, at the time, I had no idea, like, none, but I, I listened, and I did what I felt I needed to do, and, you know, she told me a year ago, like, she carried that around with her, and it gave her hope, so I just want to say, like, always listen to that, and don't get discouraged if you feel like you planted us, you know, that you're trying to help somebody, or you did something for somebody, and it doesn't, you don't see the fruit from it right away, because you don't know what kind of seeds you're planting. So that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> that was so good, Nico. <clears throat> all right, all right, all right. So we got, uh, man, the guy who's going to speak next is just, what a story. What a, God has just been pouring favor on his life so much lately, and I just can't wait for him to, him and his daughter are going to share uh, some stuff, and I know it's going to be amazing. I can't wait to hear it. Uh, give it up for Dave. Okay, guys, so I... We wanted to give you guys a different perspective. Like, you guys always hear my side. I can always tell you what the addict side of this whole destructive path is. But it's not very often we get to hear it from somebody that's not an addict that we affected. So, um, <clears throat> you have to bear with her. She doesn't do public speaking very well. But I'm going to give it. This is my. <clears throat> so, this is my 19-year-old. And for pretty much 18 years of her life I wasn't involved because I was chasing dope. So, um, I'll talk more about that in a second, but here is Katie. Um, 
Okay, um, I feel like I'm going to throw up. <laughs> um, so, obviously, he already told you I was 19. So, pretty much my whole entire life, my dad's been an addict. He's pretty much, like, never been in my life. And if he has been in my life, it's pretty much always been bad. Um, all of me growing up as a little kid, my mom was always trying to teach me to stay away from drugs, to always say no to drugs. Um, but as a child, it was really difficult to try to look at the person that gave you life and tell them, I don't want to see you anymore. And it's difficult to try to see the person that brought you into this world as an addict. Um, as a child, I always used to blame God. I always used to think it was God's fault because I would spend nights and days, weeks, years, months, everything, begging God to just make my dad see that the drugs that were taking him away from me were not as important as me. I was always so heartbroken at the fact that I always had to plan my life around my dad. I always had to change everything up according to his addiction. I used to blame my dad for the longest time. I used to always think it was his fault. But then as I got older and I realized that you can't blame the addict. You have to blame the addiction. You have to blame the thing that is trying to take the pain away from the addict. All addicts deal with something, drugs, alcohol, anything that they're addicted to is ultimately a pain reliever. Um, for the longest time, I used to think that it was always my dad's fault, that I was always struggling with my mental health. I used to always think that, like, my dad was the reason why I could never hold relationships, I could never talk about my feelings, because in reality, because my dad, my dad was an addict while I was so young, my dad was the first person to ever break my heart. It was really difficult for me to have my dad miss out on so much. I had graduated high school, my dad wasn't there. I got my license, my dad was there, but not was, he wasn't there. Um, so many milestones that I made, I couldn't thank my dad for it. And as hard as that sounds, when you have an addict, you have to be hard. Um, a lot of times whenever I was growing up, a lot of, my mom tried to shelter me from my dad's addiction. My mom tried to um, make it seem like it wasn't an addiction. Obviously, no one wants to tell their seven-year-old that their dad likes heroin more than their child. I don't think any parent would want to tell their kid that. I remember very distinctly being a child and I would see my dad in active addiction. I still love my dad in every way possible when he was going through his addiction, but it was very hard to see that side of my dad. Um, me and my dad have always bonded no matter how much time has passed, no matter how many years we go without speaking to each other. It's very difficult to try to turn my back on my father. I've let him hurt me numerous times and I always make excuses for it. I always say it's okay and I always give him the benefit of the doubt even when I knew he was getting high even when he was standing right in front of me and I could clearly see that he was high, I still made excuses for him. And it was hard to try to push him out of my life, I guess you would say. 
as a child, I would be filled with anxiety. Anytime the phone would ring, I always thought it was going to be that call. And if you're an addict, you know what that call is. No child should have to panic when the phone rings at the thought of someone in their family passing that way. I have been with my dad for, I don't know, how long have you been sober now? Yeah. Me and my dad have tried to repair our relationship for a couple of months now, and I can say that my dad being sober has fixed so many life problems for me. I am able to open up about certain things. I'm able to connect with certain people on certain levels. I have never been able to talk about addiction. I've never been able to speak on my dad. I used to be filled with so much anger. I used to try to fight people at the, the thought of them even speaking about my dad in an ill way. And now that my dad is sober, it's so much easier for me to tell people that my dad beat addiction. But it... But, guys, for three years of that span, I was sober, but I didn't have God. Big difference. So even when I was sober, for three years straight, it wasn't, I mean, Austin remembers this. I don't know where Austin is, but he remembers. So for three years of that, I was sober, but I didn't have God in my life at all. I believed in something completely different, um, and I still wasn't a part of her life, didn't want to be around, like all these things. But the thing that I wanted you guys to see tonight was <clears throat> she's never done a drug in her life. But do you, do you see the damage that me doing drugs happened? But that could be repaired, okay? Um, <clears throat> it didn't get repaired from me just snapping my fingers. It didn't get repaired from her wishing it to happen. It got repaired because the very first time <clears throat> um, I was at the church and Tim told me that if I wanted – all of those things to go away, to come to the altar and give it to God. I did. And so two weeks ago, okay, two weeks ago yesterday, we had a beautiful baby girl. She was, she was five pounds, eight ounces, right? But at the same time, we had somebody come in and tell her, you can't take her home, we're taking her from you. Okay, so that should have broke your heart, and it did, and we, I tried to hold it together, but it didn't work out really well, right, because we had already had my, all my kids there holding her, Tashar's kids there holding her, like, we thought we were going to get to take her home, <clears throat> so, I mean, everybody was starting to connect with this baby, and then I had to call them and tell them that we couldn't take her home, that they were taking her and putting her in foster care, <clears throat> That was probably the biggest test of my faith I've ever had. Okay, right there at that point, at any other point in my life, I would have said, I'm done. I'm not doing any recovery no more. I'm not doing God no more. I'm not doing none of this. I'm going to get high. At any other point in my life, I would have threw away the rest of my kids because somebody took one of my kids for something that I did, not for something that anybody else did. So, <clears throat> but... Instead of, like, giving it up, going and getting high, we called the people that we depend on, the people that are our family in the church. <clears throat> and Tim and Roger and a whole bunch of other people just told us that it was going to be okay. And I could have gave up on God at that point, and it would have been very easy to give up on God. But instead, I actually had to, I got conflicted because I was like, do I... Does it seem like I just don't care? Because I believed that God was going to fix it. Um, and I believed that wholeheartedly. So it, it didn't seem like it bothered me at all. So at first I was like, 
are people going to think that I just don't care? But the thing was, I honestly believed that without a doubt, God had it. And tomorrow at 3.30, she comes home for good. Not only that, not only that, but tomorrow at 3.30, Tashar's daughter comes home for good. So basically what the, the moral of the story is, like, <clears throat> um, because we we're able to give it to God completely and not try to put my hands in it and not try to be like, well, here, I'm going to give you all of it but, but this. I'm going to give you all of you but my finances. I'm going to give it all to you but my marriage. I'm going to give it all to you but my kids. Like, I was like, I'm going to give it all to you. And I have faith that you're not going to drop it. And because of that, God has restored my whole family. I don't have a missing piece at all now. Um, he, and basically, I did what I would have never done before ever. Um, since they took the baby, I haven't missed an altar call. One, I've been up here. When everybody else is gone, I'm still up here. Um, and I never once prayed for God to give my daughter back. I prayed that he would do what was right, that he would do what was necessary, that he would do that he would do his will, and that the judge would have a heart. I never once asked to have my daughter back. <clears throat> and by doing that, I mean, the judge yesterday had full rights to just be like, we're taking them, you're not getting them back. But he was like, even though it hasn't been perfect, I believe that you deserve your kids. So, like, that feeling right there was better than any high I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> There, there's two things in this whole situation in the church that will make you have that feeling. One is watching God restore your life from all the damage you created, okay? And I created all that damage. Like, I'd love to be here and sit and say, it wasn't me, it was my addiction, but it was me. <clears throat> um, and until I was able to own that, I couldn't start fixing it. So, <clears throat> and it took me years to own it. Like, I was like, ah, it's, it's my mom's fault. I did this because I, I got depression. I did this because I'm afraid of stuff. Like, no, I did it because I, I really wanted to do it. But the thing is, is that and, like, I've got friends in here that I was in the street with and seeing them, like, jump or, like, slim right here. So, like, <clears throat> seeing them jump around praising God, that, that right there is a better feeling than you'll ever find in the street, too. Like, <clears throat> so I'm see not only seeing God restore my whole family, he's also restoring my friends at the same time. Like, <clears throat> and to see that light come on in people, like, if, if you are having any doubt, in your mind of, that this is going to work. It may take 18 years, but you just can't give up. you got to keep going every day until it happens. <clears throat> and the thing with God is God's always going to do the right thing, but he may not do it in your time frame. He's definitely not going to do it when I want it to happen, but he's going to do it when he wants it to happen. So it's just being able to hold out and wait until it happens the way God wants it to happen. But I hope I gave you guys some hope. I hope you guys love the loved ones there. Okay, I just want to say one other thing. Um, I do not do public. Uh, I do not do public speaking at all. But the whole sole purpose in me coming here today, which thank you guys for having me. Um, the whole, the sole purpose in me coming here is to show that if you're struggling with addiction and you have kids, you have family, your family is not gonna hate you forever. Your family's not gonna be mad at you forever. Your children are not gonna be mad at you forever. I can't speak for other kids, but I know that because my dad is sober, it's so much better. So you can get sober for your family.